Um, if there is one single innovation which has brought the Great War alive in the past 10 to 15 years, it's the increasing quality of colorized uh, photographs of, uh, of the Great War. They are simply astonishing where they get the colors accurate. And in the promotion for the uh, talk, which we're going to have today, you saw two excellent examples, one of which uh, has been colorized from the burial of the, the Red Baron uh, in, in 1918. Um, currently, the technology permits great accuracy and even the digitization of the photograph to increase its, uh, its um, clarity and precision. It's, it's really uh, important. And just to end, there was an exhibition in New Zealand uh, as part of one of Sir Peter Jackson's uh, World War I um, exhibitions in, uh, in uh, Wellington that took a, a whole bunch of New Zealand photographs of the Great War, increased them almost 10 times, colorized them and digitized them. And they were, uh, that's further evidence of the interest uh, that Sir Peter has in, in remembering the Great War. Uh, Paul, can I put my two cents worth in about the Red Baron? Yes. Uh, that colorization, um, the red color that's been, now this is a, a, a potential pitfall with colorization is that the person doing the work has to decide what color do I use. Now, if you look around the internet, most of the renderings of the Red Baron's aircraft are sort of a bright lipstick red, often glossy. But I've got a bit of the fabric <laughs> uh, received <laughs> from John Love, actually. And uh, the, um, the Red Baron's aircraft was really a dried blood color. It was a dark crimson. <laughs> and uh, if you read diary accounts, you find this low, looking at uh, relics in the museums, it's quite obvious that the, the colouring of the aircraft was done in a fairly uh, slapdash manner. And uh, depending on whether they were painting on the, uh, on the darker linen on the triplane or the lighter linen under the wings and so on, they got quite different shades of red. So there are, there are different shades in the museum collections. But um, yeah, so our, our colourised photograph on the publicity that was sent out, as people would have seen, uh, to my eye, is a bit too lipsticky. It needs to be a, a bit darker. <laughs> but that, there we go. The museum at the Omaka Airfield in the north of the South Island of New Zealand contains a life-size diorama of Australian troops pillaging the Red Baron's aircraft. And you can walk around that uh, um, recreation of, of the event. And to his credit, Sir Peter uses that blood red color. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Can I say that about that diorama? Uh, I imagine many of you will have gone to a market, which everyone should do. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, but if, if you look at that diorama, you've got a couple of uh, basically people with tin hats on uh, pulling the boots off the Baron. And I can tell you now, the two boots that were donated to the Australian War Memorial both came from officers in three squadrons the engineering officer and the guy who ran the funeral. And the three squadron people didn't get access to the Baron until the body was basically retrieved under fire. This is after the, the original um, crowd ran up around the aircraft. And so al although the, the uh, diorama, you know, has a lot of presence and it's very well done, uh, it, it probably doesn't represent the real scene that was there. And in particular, um, the tin hats and things, the crash occurred well behind the front lines, you know, back in the artillery line. And um, I can well imagine that people wouldn't all have been kitted out as combat troops. You know, there would have been a lot of drivers. I think many of the people who deposited evidence were, you know, drivers and other artillery lines people. I, um, I've just had recent correspondence with a descendant of Private Frank Wormald um, via our website. Andrew sent it through to me or via Facebook, um, Jenny Birchall, who's a granddaughter of Private Frank. And Private Frank um, helped Lieutenant Fraser pull the body out with the help of two other two others. They, the two of them tried and then and then they, they needed four of them to pull out the body. 
and then they laid it down. And I think on that diorama, we've got Fraser and Frank, because <laughs> they're the two people who are with the body at the body, at the head of the body. But you're right, there are them people pulling on the feet. <laughs> Yeah, also, I'd be confident that the boots made it back to three squadron. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Although, to be fair, I was looking at Dale Titler or Titler's book, and he talks about, he, he, he has a, a letter from some some soldier who said that he pulled the boots off <laughs> at the scene. Well, I mean, they, they might have been confiscated again. You never know. I, I, I wonder whether they, in fact, were. There was a degree of uh, criticism of what was going on. <laughs> Yeah, a little love for the German artillery, yes. Certainly Harold Edwards, who was with Three Squadron at the time, always maintained that there was a lot that kept coming in, even after the funeral. Bits yeah. were being uh, brought in. The officers in particular felt that they had more of a claim to them than the men. <laughs> oh, well. Um, um, well... I, I think I think three of the three of the officers that we know all got bits of them. <laughs> yeah, not large bits. I, I, I emphasise not large bits at all. Hello, John Love. I'm referring to you there. <laughs> Hi. Hello, John Love. Is a, I, I've probably explained before is a son of Nigel Love, who was a three squadron pilot, and uh, other and you know other exploits as well thank you john great to see you um i'm just seeing that it's probably coming up to 2 30 pm now and we've got um uh 22 participants now um 21 sorry um <clears throat> so shane i might um first of all before swinging over to you just introduce you if i may mm -hmm. um uh, so um for, for those people who haven't, um, who, who've just uh, tuned in now, uh, I'm the secretary of the um, Australian Society of World War One Era Historians and um, hosting uh, uh, this section of the meet of, of our meeting, which which is which is over. And um, uh, I'll introduce our speaker to you. Um, uh, Shane is a senior curator, heraldry sec heraldry technology at the Australian War Memorial. Um, he studied at the University of Canberra and later at the ANU, took a master's in maritime archeology span at the University of Bristol and master's in museum studies at Leicester. Uh, whilst at the Memorial, Shane has undertaken curatorial deployments with the ADF to Bougainville, as part of the ADF's render safe operation to the Middle East to record RAAF operations as part of our Operation Accordion and to Operation Augury in the Philippines. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Before working the memorial, he worked as an archaeologist and museum curator in Bristol, in the United Kingdom, and also worked for the UK's largest private sector conservation company, EURA, e -U -R -A, Conservation, for six years. Shane is currently working on exhibitions for the War Memorial's development program, which I imagine takes up night and day. Um, Michael Garside, However, Shane has added some little postscripts to that. No, he points no. out that you are, in fact, a marine diver as well. <laughs> and um, and uh, as well, you um, uh, have um, uh, extensive knowledge on both, both world wars and uh, a leading expert on artillery and paint, <laughs> expert on the V2 and large technology objects in general. <laughs> so uh, he was probably he was probably swinging the lead there a bit. I think. <laughs> <pushing it out. laughs> oh dear. Um, so I'm going to what I'm going to do, um, Shane, is I might co get you to co-host, which might might yep. save us a few problems. Uh, okay. And I'll just make co-host. There we are. Let's see if that works. We need to co-host this meeting. There we are. Right. And will that allow you to share? So I'll, I'll click the share screen now, and, and if you can tell me, Des, if it works or not. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, where are we? There we go. That one there. Can you all see that? We yeah. see oh, fantastic, fantastic. fantastic. And, okay, and, uh, and I'll just, um, I'll just maximise. I'll just say one, one other housekeeping item. I, I won't mute people 
um, unless there's a bit of noise coming in, if that's all right, Shane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it, are you okay to take some questions on the way through? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. That's 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 terrific. And finally, uh, over on the right-hand side of your view, at the top right of your screen, anybody, uh, if you want to reduce the number of photos there, you can go to the options under view and remove the screens of other people there if you wish to, to get a full picture. Uh, that's all I have to say, um, Shane. I'll okay, leave it great. over to you. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Um, well, thanks very much for inviting me to talk today. Um, just um, the, the, the discussion we had just a few minutes ago was really interesting. We, we've got quite a number of um, Red Baron pieces, and uh, one of your members, Col Owers, and I have looked at all of those pieces, and uh, very, very interesting in terms of the colour and the, the degree to which they've oxidised or, or whatever. But it's also interesting that there was this real trade very early on in selling pieces of the Red Baron material. So often you get, I don't know whether you can see my image there, but pieces about, oh, four inches by four inches cut and they're very, very square. And um, one of the pieces that we had was painted a very, very, a very lipsticky red. And um, it looked a bit odd, you know. And, uh, but on the other side of that was um, night, German night lozenge fabric, you know. And, it, and it, was, it was pretty clear, I think, that someone had, had somehow got some of this German night lozenge, had painted it red, and then tried to flog it off as Red Baron material. You know, and for many, many years in our collection, it was that was its title, you know, Red Baron fabric. And I think it's really interesting as an artifact in itself, not just because it's got the night lozenge, but because it's evidence of that very, very early attempt to cash in on the, the Red Baron's, um, you know, fame and popularity and everything. Anyway, uh, enough of the Red Baron. Um, we could talk about that all the time. Oh, although I should say, next year, next financial year, we're hoping to get a a really sophisticated um, colorometer or colorimeter uh, that will allow us to um, uh, take really good, um, very, very objective recordings of color on all of these things. So one of the first things we want to do is um, field gray items, for example, you know, there's, there's a, a whole array of those and we just want to be able to, if you like, track down and find out um, which factories specialized in different colors or whether parts in our collection that have become separated over the hundred years can be reunited through an analysis of color. So it's a, it's a very, very expensive piece of kit and um, we haven't got it yet, but we're, we're really pushing for it. Now, onto the um, presentation today. Um, so I, uh, part of my screen's sort of blocked out by the, the zoom thing, but um, I want to talk to you today about five large objects in our collection that have been in our collection, um, most of them for a very, very long time. Uh, four of the five have been with us for oh, over a hundred years now, and the last one um, has only come in in the last two or three years. They're all related to the First World War, and three of them, as you can see on the screen there, are uh, German Reisenflugzeug um, artifacts, so the really large uh, multi-engined aircraft. Um, now, why did, why did I select these particular objects? Um, well, as it says there, uh, there's only one that's ever been um, uh, displayed before, uh, and that was actually displayed for an awfully long time with a completely wrong nomenclature. You know, we, uh, it's, it's one of the failings, I suppose, of any institution that, that goes on for 100 years. The information gradually gets diffuse, and the people who originally collected it um, have long since died or material becomes disassociated from the information that was originally with it. Um, and, and so we're constantly, constantly relying on people like yourselves to put us on the right track. You know, we don't, we don't know everything. You know, we're not, we're not the experts on every single item, uh, far from it. And, and really, you know, all the time we, we have people like Colin, for example, or, or, or Gus, um, putting us right on these things. Now, um, each one of these objects uh, has, has, a, has a problem or a challenge or a, or a set of challenges. And one of the first is identification. You know, exactly what are they and why are they important? Why, why do they take up our real estate and why should the, the government and taxpayer ultimately um, pay for their continued preservation? And also some of them are really quite um, tricky. They're, they're large, they're, 
they're fragile, um, they have issues of dangerous materials inherent in them, and some of them have a thing called inherent vice. So the materials from which they're made are gradually over time degrading and becoming more friable or sometimes chemically changing into a different uh, product that's, that then becomes dangerous in itself. Um, now, the, the first two items are... Um, I, I, I'm sorry? I'm, oh, I missed that. <laughs> I don't know whether that was a, meant to be on screen. <laughs> All right, right. Um, the, the first two items are from uh, the aerodrome at Moorville. And um, so these are recovered by the Australian War Records section from, uh, from Moorville. Moorville was, uh, was a big, uh, basically one of the first strategic bomber um, air bases ever to become operational. And, and as it says there on the screen, uh, how's that particular unit, which flew the, the massive Je Zeppelin Starkins? Um, uh, which, uh, you know, when you think about it, we've got a Lancaster in our collection. It's got a 30 metre wingspan. People ooh and ah about the size of it, but it's nothing compared to the size of a Starkin, you know, absolutely huge. And the one there that's on the screen is, um, is actually a, one that will become important in the, in the story a little bit later on. I've, I've got a little excerpt of, um, of what happened to that particular one at Moorville and why it's kind of, kind of relevant to our artefacts. But it's the R-45, which, uh, which flew uh, missions from Moorville uh, to La Havre, for example. And uh, these, these are long, long missions going about, you know, 300 kilometres. Now, um, the items were both, the, the first two items, uh, which I'll get to in a second. Um, in fact, I'll show them to you now. These are them there. The red coloured thing is a, is a beacon uh, from a 32 metre high lattice mast and it housed an electric light. It was basically like a little lighthouse. And connected to the beacon, uh, running down the lattice mast, was a telephone cable and an electrical system connecting then with the airfield at Moorville, which was two kilometres away. And the item there on the right-hand side, which I'll get to in a bit, is a landing light from Moorville. Now, that's a picture there of the, the landing beacon on its lattice um, uh, mast. And you can see it's an enormously huge thing. Down at the bottom, we can see a couple of Australian soldiers. And these are, um, we think these are, uh, there's an individual from the 23rd Battalion and an individual from the 7th Field Company, um, Royal Australian Engineers. Um, and, uh, and you can see the, the beautiful countryside around there. The, um, I've zoomed in on some of the photographs that we have of this. Uh, they're all glass plate negatives. And uh, that's the base of the tower there. And just to the left of it, you can see an AWRS um, uh, car. And then the, the, the thing just in front of the car is a, is a Belgian cow. <laughs> the, um, one of the great things about um, some of the glass plate negatives in the collection is just the extent to which you can keep zooming, zooming, zooming in and see all sorts of details that you never thought were possible. Um, this photograph uh, shows the removal of the beacon. Um, so it was, uh, you know, Im immensely heavy. Uh, it must have been quite a dangerous and, uh, you know, sweaty job getting it down, and, and it, it took one and a half hours to get down. Um, now, these photographs that I'm showing you were all in an album, and they were only found... Well, they've been in our collection for a long, long time, but not every album has been digitised, you know? It's, it's often the case, particularly with something that's, if you like, boring or um, not quite you know, identifiable immediately, that it, it doesn't get scanned. And, uh, and this particular one, we came across, or this series, I should say, we came across about a year and a half ago by accident. And it was only in coming across it and, and seeing it that we realised that this was an object that was actually elsewhere in the collection. Uh, this photograph shows the, the, some of the people responsible for um, taking the, the thing down. Now, if you see the, the front tyre of the car, just in front of it, lying on its side, that's our uh, landing beacon as well. Um, in the process of taking it down, unfortunately, they, they smashed most of the glass and uh, it was recovered and brought back to Australia, but in the hundred years since, it's long since disappeared. And um, I'm hopeful that we, you know, we might be able to find it one day or bits of it. Um, that's a, a close up. Uh, in fact, that's interesting. It's sort of um, modern uh, red 
Red Baron Red, isn't it, really? <laughs> Lipstick Red. Mm. But you can see details there of, um, of some of the electrical cable, particularly on the right-hand one going up. And uh, the left-hand one is, is the base of, the, uh, of the, the, the thing. Now, this photograph is interesting in that it, it allows us to sort of say, well, hang on a moment, we've got buildings around this beacon. Uh, can we possibly identify exactly where it was? And for a long time, you know, I was looking at Google Earth. I was trying to, I drew little maps of these buildings here to try to work out, you know, what they looked like in plan view and whether I could then match that to buildings around Morville, Flavion, uh, in, in, uh, in that area. Um, and with, with no luck, you know, it was, it was really, really difficult. And I, I came to the conclusion that um, over the hundred years and two German occupations, the roofs have changed, de developments happened, etc. You know, and the buildings have been knocked down or, or whatever. You know, maybe there's a supermarket there. Um, but then I came across this one here. And this, uh, this little photograph shows a little roadside chapel. And uh, it unnamed, but very, very clear to the, the beacon there. And, um, you know, came to the idea that, well, this, this can't have disappeared. You know, if it's a chapel, it's a very religious area. Let's have a look for those. And, uh, and again, though, I, I, was, I was thwarted because time and time again, I found actually four of these little roadside chapels all within about a 10 kilometer radius of the airfield. And, and I started to um, actually, you know, give up the, the possibility of finding it. But then luckily I found this one. And this is the Chapel de la Vierge, um, and it's in a completely different um, direction to the one I was looking at. I've, I've now, this is um, a screenshot from just Google Earth, you know, and uh, Street View. And I've, I've triangulated it and I've gone down the road, found the, those other buildings there. You know, this is absolutely the one. So where you see the donkey there, I reckon about another 50 metres possibly to the right hand side and just a bit beyond and that's our that's our area and when you look at this area if you if you type in Chapel de la Vierge um, um, uh, and the, the name of the town you get that crossroads intersection and everything and uh, I'll show it to you in a second uh, because I'm going to show you where the location of both these objects are generally this is the uh, landing light and, uh, and again, you can see the um, electrical plug there. This was one of 13 laid out at that airfield. And uh, that is a picture there. Again, very, very recently discovered picture, um, you know, two years ago. And so if you go towards the horizon, um, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, and then you go across, there's, they're, they're all laid out in a T formation there. Now this, this airfield is still in operation. It, um, during the Second World War, it was a night fighter base for the, for the Germans. And then in uh, late, very late 1944, it was taken over and became a lightning and thunderbolt um, uh, station for the Americans. Uh, nowadays, it's a, a Belgian military um, airfield and it, uh, it flies F-16s. Unfortunately, when you look at Google Earth, it's all been blurred because of that, because it's still um, you know, military base. Uh, that's, that's a plan view of one of the lights and the close-up of the electrical system. And this view here then shows you uh, a kind of a macro view. Over on the left-hand side, I've got a little symbol there with an aeroplane on it. That's the airfield. And then if you go right over to, um, you can see uh, Flavion there, and then up and to the right, that kind of red dot with the white thing, that's the location of that uh, beacon. Um, going due south from that you've got the the village of uh, uh, Morville and and this is why it's very confusing the um, the airfield now is called Florin um, but in the in olden days it was called Morville and uh, and so when I was looking for this these these areas I was you know completely geographically in the wrong area um, and then this map then shows you where it is in relation to the rest of the um, uh, the continent so Back in the day, uh, when um, RFA 500 was flying from this uh, field, they they were going basically almost southwest to La Havre there, and they were also doing a couple of raids on Paris, and uh, and I think I think they did Beauvais one or one or one, once or twice. The other um, uh, Starken unit and and Gothi unit, uh, RFA 500, uh, 50501, sorry, was the um, 
the main unit that was doing the, the raids on London. And they were basically based around Ghent up there and going across the, the channel. So um, that's, uh, that's object number one and number two. Uh, number three um, is, um, I, I think, uh, quite an interesting uh, object. It's um, these two massive, um, beautiful wooden uh, propellers. Um, and uh, I've, I've, I've given the title of Seaman Shook at Verk, uh, Rising Flugs Air Propellers, because again, um, uh, and I, I think the analysis points towards this. Um, that's, uh, that's a little picture of me there, um, taken um, uh, earlier this week. And you can see just, um, I'm, I'm actually touching one of those propellers and it's, um, it's four meters long. It's, it's a massive thing. I wouldn't be surprised, although you know, I'm happy to be corrected on this, if they're amongst the biggest um, uh, propeller blades in existence uh, today. Uh, and in fact, it'd be kind of nice to, to think that they were. Um, so the mystery is, um, you know, what, what is it? Um, because originally, when they were recovered and tagged up by the Australian War Records section, they, they were just described as Zeppelin propellers. And um, now the people who collected it, I think, thought and knew that they were, or thought that they were from Zeppelin Starkens. Um, but over time, over the hundred years, you know, the knowledge of the Starkin, I think, became lost to, you know, popular consciousness. And so, but, but Zeppelin became associated with airships, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the ones that raided London and whatnot. Um, and, um, and so, you know, when um, I, I think maybe three years ago, our tags on this object would have said Zeppelin airship uh, propeller blade. But uh, I, I actually think it's it's not from one of those. It's from uh, one of these um, R planes, Ryzen Flugzeug planes. And um, and we've got quite a, a, a bit of uh, information that, that points us towards this. And this photograph here, um, I've kind of called it the Rosetta Stone of this particular object. It's the, the hub of the uh, of the propeller blade, and um, I'll I'll read off some of the the um, information on that. Uh, you can see uh, stamped there these these stampings. Um, you know, very common to find on on propeller blades, but often on the face of it rather than on the the side of it. Um, and this is what it says on on the side of that um, thing. So it's got an R, which I think might might be Ryzen Flugzeug uh, N ninety five serial number. 330 um, PS horsepower, diameter of 430 centimetres. And it's interesting, the Germans almost invariably, uh, particularly with artillery anyway, um, gave measurements in centimetres, never in millimetres. Um, you always find it in centimetres. Uh, and then the, the pitch, and then SSWD, Siemens Schuckenwerk. Uh, now, um, you know, what, what was the SSWR plane? Um, you know, many, many of your members probably probably know are very very familiar with it, but maybe some aren't. Um, very very unusual aircraft. Um, I've got a picture of it in the next slide, um, but and here it is here. Um, so it's a swallow-tailed aircraft, twin-engined, uh, but the engines are, are mounted in line uh, inside the fuselage, and it seems like one of the common characteristics or defining factors of a um, Ryzen Flux egg. Um, was that it, it had to be able to have the engines serviced and maintained in flight. And so in this particular aircraft you had three engines in line and you had your mechanic operating and tinkering around with them in, in flight. The Starkin, by contrast, had, um, it, it had four propellers but in two nacelles and the nacelles were outside the aircraft and you had the mechanics actually seated in a little bay inside the nacelle and so he could do all his tinkering there you know while the aircraft was in flight you also had dual controls on each of the Ryzen Flugzeug and then you also had the capability of um, leaving your controls and and being relieved by someone else so there were a whole bunch of these defining characteristics and this one the Siemens Schuckerberg um, R planes they only ever built uh, seven of them and um, they were they were very very slow, um, very uh, l their ceiling was quite low. I think it was something like about three thousand meters. Excuse me, and they were mainly used on the um, eastern front. 
they were only brought to the uh, Western Front or or to, to Cologne anyway after the the fall of the Eastern Front and they would have been pretty much you know mincemeat for the uh, our fighters on the on the Western Front um, uh, now how do we know that our propeller blade um, is from one of these aircraft well we don't precisely know the diameter of the SSW blades but we've got quite a lot of photographs of them and just by scaling up uh, you know we can work out that they are around about between 3.5 and 4 meters and our our propeller blades are of that size we've got SSW stamped on them which is you know a tick um, but the the key thing is the the horsepower rating and and it, it takes a bit of mathematics here because um, when you look at the, the different types of engines fitted to the different types of SSWRs, and they changed over time, it's clear that um, most of them, most of the, the seven of them, were fitted with three 220 power horsepower uh, Benz engines. And so when you add those, the horsepower up, you get 660 divided by two and you get your 330. And these, these engines, um, the three of them, were all connected via a uh, um, uh, a con rod sort of um, drive shaft, I should say, to the um, the nacelles uh, and a very complicated sort of gearing system that allowed it to run. So what happened was, if you lost power in an engine, for example, you wouldn't lose all your power to both engines. You'd just lose your some of your horsepower. And so, um, at at the time, they thought you know it it might be a better thing to have all the engines inside the fuselage because not only is the um, the mechanic able to communicate with the pilot very very easily, um, but he's also in relative comfort. And if you lost power in an engine, you wouldn't suddenly get asymmetry in the the power of the engine. You know, whereas with the Starken, if you lost an engine, you'd suddenly get you know one engine sort of you know overgearing. Now it turns out that they that wasn't such a problem for the Starkens. So they were very easily able to accommodate that. And there's quite a lot of stories of them over London, for example, and um, the oil supply, for example, freezing up, you know, in one of one of the engines, and them actually being able to, you know, open up the fuel can and and heat it and and manually add the fuel the the oil, you know, to the engine and everything, and um, and the pilot, you know, if he was experienced, being able to accommodate it, um, but. Early on in the war, 1915-16, that wasn't uh, the case. They didn't really know that they were capable of doing that. Uh, now, this is the uh, possibly the, 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 the proof of the pudding, if you like. And this is, um, uh, I tried to get this for you as a, as a really big download of a, of a glass plate negative, but um, uh, I'm afraid the technology kind of failed me. That's the best I can do for you tonight. Now, this was um, this is a really strange photograph. You know, it's taken at Bickendorf, near Cologne. So, four squadron um, um, uh, went there in um, oh, very late in uh, 1918 and stayed there for a number of months. You know, in 19, uh, 1919, and um, and their um, war record is all digitised and online. You know, have a look at. The I'm sure you've many of you have probably gone through that, but it's really interesting. They, there's lots of stuff in there about um, not fraternising with the German population and all that sort of stuff. R lots of really good social history, but this guy, this photograph shows that same really really tall structure. You can see the two engine nacelles there. You can see the drive shaft going to the centre of the fuselage, and the one thing that really kind of um, threw me for a long time was that that wheel dolly sitting underneath and because you know that that just didn't doesn't appear in any of the drawings and you know what's going on there but then when you scan this in and um, we've got it as a glass plate as I said if you go in zoom 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 right into the the wheels you can see very clearly that they're not part of the aircraft structure you know they, they've been added to maneuver maybe to drag that that uh, structure off the off the airfield and, and clear the runway or whatever so it's a bit of a bit of a um, red herring that um, the next photograph is really poor quality again, um, but this shows the same aircraft, but maybe a month or two afterwards. And so this is taken from the port side, and uh, it's the same one. You can see the the swallow tail starting to develop there, just about halfway through the the, the middle of the photograph. So it's um fascinating aeroplanes these these ones were, and the 
so getting back to the object though um it's um i think it's really really if it is from one of these aircraft and i'm kind of convinced myself that it is then what we've got is possibly the only surviving remnants of this particular class of aircraft mm -hmm. now uh going oh oh yeah here we go that's just um that's a close-up of uh, the tip of one of the aircraft and you can see the the finish is starting to really craze you can see the laminations there and you can see just on the left hand side what uh, in boat building would be called a dutchman uh, it's a, a nice little repair presumably done by the germans uh, close up again of the, the crazing. This is another uh, number two of the uh, propeller and clearly there's a different finish going on here and it would be really good to get some you know some um, um, chemical analysis or, or, or whatever done of what the finish is I think. Uh, oh here we go that's 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 it next object um, kind of aircraft related well I, you know, I'm pretty sure it is um, this is one that came into the collection uh, very, very recently, um, and it, it came from Canada uh, as a um, as a loan, but a long term loan. And we're we're making overtures to the Canadian War Museum to actually um, get it transferred to us uh, for good. So it's uh, again made by Siemens Schuckertwerk, the same company that made your uh, beautiful swallow tailed aircraft, and it's um, it's as far as I know the only known German. Um, Scheinwerfer in existence. Um, now, um, the um, when you look at the the pedestal on which it sits, you've got these two arms that come out. They're the means by which one person could adjust the azimuth, and another person could adjust the uh, elevation of the thing. Um, the glass. If you look at the glass, you see you can see there's uh, these vertical panels on it. Each one of those is a separate panel that's um, not quite touching the other panels. And we think the reason for this is the immense heat that was generated when you were shining your searchlight caused the glass to expand. And, uh, and it's a bit like um, you know, wooden uh, frame and panel construction. You needed to allow for that expansion and contraction of the glass. And then the thing has this fantastic um, iris, just like an, one of those old fashioned um, you know, SLR reflex cameras where it can, it can open up and close and it's all perfectly working. It doesn't, we don't have the carbon rods and things and we don't have the electrical system that would power it but it's, um, it probably could, could be functional. Um, there's a photograph of it um, in operation uh, or I should say in transport. Uh, that's a, an Austrian um, u unit and you can see those vertical panels very very clearly there. There's a sort of bars that go across it to stop them from being smashed. This is a, a smaller version of a Scheinwerfer. I just wanted to show you kind of the, the nature of the beam and everything. That's uh, the Schwein, uh, the, the, the light thrower in, in war is, is basically that translation. And it talks about the, um, the a Boehm, uh, uh, Bo 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 officer is a sort of an observation officer and a telegra tele te telegraphist. Um, now, what are the challenges of this object? Um, well, well, when it came to us, it was, uh, chock full, as you'd expect, I guess, of friable asbestos. And uh, this is the, the, the really nasty asbestos that isn't bonded to anything. You know, you touch it and it just, you know, forms a powder. And really, we, um, we had enormous difficulty even bringing it into the country. We had to get all sorts of exemptions and things to, to, to bring it in. It had to be kind of hermetically sealed to, to bring it in. Um, we've subsequently gone through a big process and an expensive process of getting the friable asbestos removed and uh, um, completely, you know, taken away, so that it, it is now um, a safe thing. Um, it had some damage um, at some stage. You know, some of the um, um, uh, elevation mechanism was 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 operated beyond the point of safe. Um, operation and we had some some elements actually pierced the side of the thing and we also got some missing elements from it um, particularly the carbon rods and things like that um, and but but the one of the big problems with it is is provenance uh, I, I've got a question mark there we we are pretty sure that this particular one is one that was captured by an Australian infantry battalion um, and um, you know the, the the war diaries and the AWRS records certainly point to um, you know a, a precise uh, um, replica of this one being captured by them um, and 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 rescued for AWRS and Australian mu museum um, life later on. Um, uh, 
but we also know that one was captured by the Canadians. But, but there's no, absolutely no record of the Canadians ever moving it to a railhead and recovering it uh, to Canada. So, so this one, it looks like um, this uh, was one of the ones that was um, w what, what was called seeded. So um, often all of these items would be brought back into a, a gun park. And, um, and there are photographs in, in our collection of these gun parks where you've got um, um, the objects would be painted up with, say, 45th Battalion or 23rd Battalion or whatever, whoever captured it. And, um, and then some, sometimes, though, those items then get shipped back to England to a, um, and then for distribution to the Commonwealth. And uh, it's only when a really good case can be made for it to, to be associated with a particular battalion and, and Australia in particular, that it, it made the journey back to Australia. Um, so we have, you know, quite a lot of that. It, it's very, very common with artillery, you know, that we can, um, we can track this process down. This item, less so. Um, uh, there's, there's another shot. Um, just after we got it, uh, we, we were able to find in uh, Holland a beautiful um, original German manual. And, uh, and it wasn't, wasn't all that expensive. I think it was about 120 euros or something. So on, on eBay, you know, believe it or not. And uh, that, that's a, actually a, a scan from it before I actually bought it and, and brought it into the country. Uh, that's a side view. And there's the Siemens Schuckertwerk uh, logo uh, on the side and on the, a big panel that cov covers the front. Uh, last object um, is again aviation related um, and this is one that actually of all of them this is the only one that's ever been on display but it's been taken off display now um, and, and kind of packed up for a number of years um, so aviation related but this one uh, was one that um, defied identification until we were luckily contacted by um, of all people a, a Russian um, artillery enthusiast uh, who's writing a book on German anti-aircraft artillery of the First World War. And um, this one, uh, there's a photograph of it, um, of, of the type, I should say, in use uh, with, a, with a German. This is probably going to be a, a mid um, to late war uh, one, uh, as evidenced by the, the camouflage that they've applied there. Um, now, what's the, the challenge of this one? Uh, well, it, this one came to us in 1919 as a gift from France. It was one of those ones I was telling you about where it's been uh, captured, put into the big melting pot of just items and then divvied up amongst uh, you know anyone who sort of put their hands up. So unfortunately, with a lot of the French stuff that we've got, um, really, really interesting. There's a little bit of battle damage on this one, but absolutely zero information on who used it or where it came from. Um, now, um, as I said, you know, we're contacted by this uh, um, crazy Russian guy, you know, who um, has been um, really, really helpful on this and a number of things. And, uh, and he's put me on to all the different examples around the world. But it's clear from examining those and, um, and very carefully measuring ours that ours is absolutely unique. You know, um, the, the barrel length and, and some of the mechanism is, is just not reproduced in, on any of the extant examples. Um, one of the other challenges that we've got um, uh, is the integrity of the object. So it's been in Australian hands for over 100 years and uh, for the first oh, probably 20 years, I reckon most of the artillery pieces associated with Australia uh, or here in Australia weren't kept uh, under good conditions. You know, they were kept in parks, RSL parks, um, wherever, you know, just, just next to the war memorial in the outdoors and um, you lost all your original paint very very quickly you lost all of the um the leather work on any of the the the, the hand wheels or um, seats um, often some of the the bronze work or the brass work would be stripped and 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 you know stolen um, and and that was the case with this you know it was, it was really um, compromised in many respects and to the point where at one stage someone even added a a second world war 25 pound a hand wheel on it you know and we then there's no record of this ever having been done and it was only sort of you know go really closely identify um, examining these things that that hang on one of these wheels just isn't the same and when you look really closely at it then you can see the actual Australian 25 pounder marks on this particular hand wheel. Um, paint survival, it has been 
repainted in uh, modern times, you know, the last 20 years or so, with a field grey coat. But luckily, um, we do actually have uh, oh, some original paint on it. I'll, I'll just go down to that. Uh, uh, there's a shot showing a uh, German unit um, operating it. This is um, a view. Uh, it's an odd one. It's, it's, um, it's only got uh, one bogey. And the bogey is unusual in that when you're ready to go and uh, to hook it up to a vehicle or to a horse, there's a sort of a rack and pinion um, thing that you operate, uh, a toothed wheel. And the, the whole mechanism of the, um, the platform and the pedestal uh, slowly ratchets up towards the, the wheels. And then, very cleverly, um, I'll just shoot on, these um, hydraulic rams push the pedestal down so that the gun then is um, is really close to the wheels and the center of gravity then is is very much more reduced and you can then safely transport it. Um, now, um, just going back a tad, if I can go back, we just found also in the French archives, um, they've, well like like anyone really, they're, they're all madly scanning and the French um, have a, um, a beautiful manual um, uh, bullets, bullets and d'artillery um, and it goes from oh you know sort of 1870 to about uh, uh, probably about 1937 or thereabouts I can't quite remember the dates but they they often will get our equipment British Australian American but also the German stuff during the Second World War, uh, First World War and they'll analyze it and just give you a good blow by blow, blow account of how to use it what makes it different what makes it good bad uh, in comparison to French equipment, and so this uh, that little photograph there, and the um, and the the first page there is um, is a, a um, you know a new discovery, if you like, um, in the French archives of one of our guns, and it kind of allowed us to kind of work out uh, well how to operate it, how to make the hydraulics work, all that sort of thing, and as you can see, they're Canon German of 77 millimeters uh, contra uh, aircraft against aircraft, um, and it's. Um, a Krupp model. Now, so their manual is very much on the Krupp one. Ours is slightly different. That's the Krupp one there, that photograph there that I'm showing on screen. But ours is an Erhardt one. They were two different families, pretty much. You know, it's a bit like Holden and um, Ford. And the difference is that um, there's, there's a completely different uh, hydraulic ram system operating. Now, this view here might be a bit kind of complicated to, to comprehend. That's the underneath of the pedestal. And you can see all sorts of different um, uh, layers of primer and field grey and, and who knows what. Very compromised paint, but nonetheless original to its manufacture. So really, really good. And, and when we get that uh, U-Butte colorimeter that I was telling you about, hopefully we can um, you know, get, get cracking on things like that. Um, there's a view of its uh, breech. So this one uh, was actually built for the most part in 1913. So it's actually before, you know, this anti-aircraft gun predates the First World War, shows that the Germans were thinking about anti-balloon, anti-aircraft um, uh, operations, uh, but they continued building these during the war and, uh, and modifying them. And this one, uh, this breach uh, was actually made by Rhein Metall, who, you know, went on to, to all sorts of huge things during the, the Second World War and are still going pretty much. Um, and S flak, that means uh, sockel flak. So the sockel being the, the, the pedestal or what the, the French would call the bascule um, that, that it was sitting on. Um, there's a close up of the um, a kind of a, an identification plate showing the, the main guts of the thing built in 1913 and uh, Rheinisch Metall And um, so basically, that comes kind of to the end. Um, it's um, you know why why these objects? Well, they're all they all represent um, aircraft related objects. The um, they all represent museological challenges to move them, store them, preserve them, uh, um, uh, interpret them. Um, but 
uh, you know, we see when we progress on to the 1930s, 1940s, all of these ideas, you know, multi, multi-engine multi aircraft, searchlight batteries, anti-aircraft systems, um, trying to navigate in the dark, trying to find your airfield, all of these things really, really become um, a key part of the strategic air campaigns, both for the Germans and for us and the Americans um, in the Second World War. And and so in many respects, you know, all of these objects kind of hark to that, um, that, that system. Um, Des, uh, that, that's me finished, shall I sh stop share? No, you don't have to. That's all right. Oh, oh, oh that, that is me kind of finished. Oh, actually, just before I do. Um, oh, no, we might have some questions. <laughs> oh, oh can, can I just quickly yeah. quickly read out? Right at the start, I showed you a picture of a Starkin number R45, and I've got I've got the um, the old-fashioned... Um, this is uh, Hadlow and Gross, The German Giants, which is a fantastic book, all about those Reisen eggs. And he talks about a particular incident that is is central to the airfield of Morville and and um, and to our lights, if you like. He says, um, can I read out a little bit for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on the 9th of August 1918, the R-45 um, uh, left um, uh, for Hanover and the next day continued to the RFA 500 airfield at Morville. That's our airfield. Um, the, the two lieutenants on board um, uh, took off to bomb Le Havre. After the raid, the R-45 received a wireless message warning not to return to Moorville because enemy aircraft were over the airfield and the landing lights, that's our landing light, could not be turned on. But the fuel supply was too low to continue on, forcing the commander to make the decision to land. The wireless operator notified the airfield and asked that ground personnel signal with flashlights. The first and second landing attempts failed, and it was on, not until a number of flares had been shot off that enough illumination was provided to enable the pilots to land down on the airfield. In spite of the emergency illumination, the R-45 missed the runway, which the crew noticed by the severe shaking they received. Suddenly in the darkness, the left wing struck an obstruction, then the right wing, and then the R-45 stood still. In the morning, the damage was inspected and it was found that the left wing had hit, had hit a water tank wagon and a large portable ladder. The right wing had hit construction material and the roof of a peasant house. This fortunate accident saved the lives of 60 men who were sleeping in a barracks directly in the path. Oh. So was, um, uh, I was a bit worried that we didn't have any kind of social history sort of angle to any of our objects there, but um, luckily found that little, little excerpt. It seems that these Starkins never had a problem taking off, never had a problem really finding London or La Havre. They were pretty much always, you know, above the ceiling of the, you know, your sop with camels and things. I think there was only one or two that were actually shot down by enemy aircraft, but it was always coming into land or, you know, that was the, the killer. That was when they all went, you know, and the same with the Gothas, that was when they all had their accidents. Um, so, um, yeah, being able to kind of um, find photographs relating to those objects and kind of link them together and say that actually, you know, if, um, the, the village, um, 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 you know, the two villages were, were actually part of the same sort of unit uh, was, was, was really quite, you know, a fun thing to do. Oh, Paul's got his hand up. Yeah. Paul's Shane, up. Uh, I want to cut to the chase and ask you two questions. Yeah. As you were looking for the five items, Firstly, did you find anything new or unusual that you didn't expect to find? And secondly, I'm staggered to hear that you use eBay to acquire <laughs> um, uh, documentary material. How competitive was the bidding for the um, manual for the searchlight? And were there, what can you tell about how you knew to go and bid for it in the first place and that sort of thing? Uh, whoa, gee, <laughs> looking at the manual, um, uh, no, I think I was the only bidder. Um, yeah. I, I think there's a pretty limited pool of people who are interested in shine verfers. <laughs> um, yeah, it's surprising, really. Um, you know, uh, I used to um, I used to work for a maritime museum in in England, um, the SS Great Britain Trust, and gee, I used to bid all the time for that, and you know, but it was competitive there. And um, amazing how many things just people don't want. We we bought actually, we bought something. Uh, or it just came in yesterday. And again, sorry, not First World War related, um, but it's um, it was what we think is the first known 
to us um, souvenir of the Australian War Memorial. And, um, and it's a plate, I don't know whether you can see my hands, it's about that size, uh, so like a tea plate. And um, it's got a picture of the War Memorial in the centre. But this thing was produced um, by the uh, by German pottery company in the um, Ger uh, in the American occupied zone of uh, Germany, so had to be done from 1945 to 1949, you know. And um, and this this was an eBay purchase for you know ten bucks. Um, and um, you know I don't know how we'd ever display that, but it's um, we you know we do kind of collect the history of the organisation as well and. And it was just a wow, you know, when we saw this we, on the underneath, it was just amazing. Um, uh, getting back to your questions there, um, yeah, look, I was out there yesterday with a, f a colleague of mine, David Pearson, who's a big artillery nut, and um, and actually the the unexpected was I'd never seen the um, the underneath of the pedestal up until that point, until yesterday, and um, so you know both of us uh, were, were quite. Uh, uh, thrilled at seeing that and, and also when we go around um, something like a, say an artillery piece you'll you'll see loads and loads of marks they'll, they'll be makers marks or they might be um, on a nut they'll have um, often you'll have one dot uh, two dots three dots etc you know and you'll have the corresponding one dot two dot three dots on the, the corresponding areas and things like that just the jo just show the hand of the maker um, so I, th I think. I, th I think. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, someone. Oh, I was just going to say. Whenever you look closely at anything with someone else, I think you're, you're bound to see something really interesting that you you didn't know about. Um, I find I find uh, my kids. I've I've shown them some stuff, and and they'll ask questions that are just completely off the, you know, that you you never expected. Well, that's fabulous. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Because I think I, I might um, so have um, uh, give Shane a bit one. of a break. I've just got one more very quick one. Yeah. Shane, it's not, it's, I'm sorry, it's not possibly related to aviation, but um, as you know, in various parks and memorial places around Australia, there are field guns. Yep, yep. And one of my interests is in identifying them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, they could be World War One. They look like they might be. They have stamps on them and marks. Is there some authority where you can identify these and match them up from a some sort of encyclopedic book, or does the War Memorial have a record? Um, we've we've got a thing called the um, the Trophy Database, and um, and it was created by uh, another Col, not Col Owers, but <laughs> another guy um, here at the at the memorial who um, basically. Um, all of these items, they came back to Australia. Um, something like 5,000 war trophies came back. Not all of them were big pieces. Some, of, Most of them would have been machine guns. And uh, there was a committee set up in Australia um, to then um, distribute these. And if you were a town like, uh, say, Goulburn near us here, that, that had sent off, say, pardon me, 300 soldiers and the local school had raised, you know, 200 pounds or whatever, you could write into this committee and you could get then um, an, an item, you know, and the more you'd sent and the bigger your contribution, the bigger your thing. So um, often you've got um, uh, um, like boarding schools, uh, King's College, let's say, or whatever, they, they might have raised a little bit of money. They might have a machine gun, you know, in their, in their refectory or, or whatever. And uh, local, local towns have, will have a, a machine gun up just up on the wall. But big towns like Goulburn will have a massive artillery piece. Now, each one of those artillery pieces has a, or should have, a, um, a, a capture history. And um, so it should, should have what it is, uh, you know, nomenclature, unit capturing it, when it was captured, where it was captured, um, um, where the railhead was that it was sent to, um, where it went to in England often, um, because they typically went back to England and then shipped out to Australia, what the ship was, and then there'll be some cryptic ones that we're not quite sure about, which we think are kind of packaging kind of numbers. And then it'll also have the destination uh, in Australia. So it'll be like um, Young or Goulburn or whatever. And, and then there might be some notes like, um, um, 
you know, some, some actual personal history about what this particular one did. Um, now that's for, of the 5,000, I reckon probably about two and a half thousand will have good information like that. There'll be another whole bunch that will just be seeded weapons. So ones that are like, like that gun that I was telling you about that just came to a gun park and then bam, came out here. We know what they are, we know how they were used, but we don't know anything about the capture event. Um, then there are ones that came out here, went out to a town, and then probably in say um, mid 1920s, early 1930s, they started to get pretty awful looking. You know, all the, the original paint's gone. The wooden wheels are some of the first things to go, and you'll find often they collapse, bam. Sometimes they kill people. You know, there are records of some of these trophy guns just bam, killing people. And so, and but often also there was a big anti-war movement, you know, in um, Australia, England, Canada, etc., in the 1920s and 30s. And you've got towns that um, form coalitions to say, we don't want that horrible thing. And, and they get rid of it, you know. So they sometimes bury it. I think Cairns or Townsville, one of the two of them, I can't remember which, um, they've got three of these trophy guns buried and we know where they are we know that they've been buried um, you know we've got photographs of them being buried and they've done sort of bits of dig to find you know that, yep they're there um, they won't be in terribly good condition but they were, would have been buried by the council back then then there are other ones that um, in the 40s 50s 60s you know were, were just um, scrapped or in modern times unfortunately there's remunerative value associated with these these things. Some have left the country. So we know of ones that have gone to New Zealand and ones that have gone to America um, in, when I say recent times, the last 20 years. Now, um, that wouldn't happen now, hopefully, because, um, you know, the protection of movable heritage sort of legislation and whatnot can be enacted and kicked in and to stop that sort of thing going. Um, um, but um, uh, getting back to your question or answer or question, um, yeah, we've got this database, um, and it's um, five thousand long, and um, and it'll um, we 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 tried and tried um, to kind of get it up and running on our system um, as a sort of a gazetteer, so that people like you and I, when we're going on holiday down to you know Melbourne, let's say, instead of going via the Hume Highway, we'd go via the War Trophy you know, route and, um, and do that sort of thing. Um, so there's some, there's some fantastic ones. There's some really original ones. One, there's some ones that are absolutely unique, don't appear anywhere else. Um, we have one in our collection uh, that we only identified again about a year ago and, um, and it's of a French 75 millimeter gun that was modified by the Germans to be an anti-aircraft gun. So it's got both French and German stampings on it. We have black and white photographs from 1921, 22, 23 or so of it down in Melbourne in a park and and then the record disappears. We don't know what happened to the gun. If we still had it, it would be unique. All we've got is the breach, you know, but it's enough, you know, it's it's, it's better to have something than nothing. Thank you um, for that. Uh, my, where my mother lives in her local park in Camden, there's some mysterious guns and I'll be able to look them up now. Right, uh, Sorry, well, it's, it's not online, I, I have to say. Um, ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So okay. That's, a good, that's a good book, yeah. Thank you so much for a very interesting talk overall. Oh, thanks. Thank no worries. So thank you, Jim. Thank you. That's a war trophy from World War One. That's a book known to you. Is it, is it changed? Mm, mm, yeah, yeah. Really good book, that. Right. Sorry, I missed the book. I didn't see the book. Sorry. War trophies from World War One, I, I think. World War One, mm -hmm. 1918. Yep. You can bring up the picture if you want to. Uh, yeah. What, one of the problems, one of the problems we've we've had is that when stuff came into the and you might find find this as well, when stuff came into the country or was captured, instead of being say a um, 105 millimeter gun, the the captors would call it a 4.5 inch or 4.7 inch such and such, you know, and so right from the get go, the nomenclature was 
was was dodgy, and um, and so our War Trophy database has a lot of those things in it, <laughs> which we're trying to get yeah. back. We're trying to get back to the original German nomenclature all the time. Terrific, terrific. Um, look, um, Shane, I think we might finish up here if that's all right. Um, okay. Yep. I um I, I we are so grateful to you for spending an hour and almost an hour and a half. <laughs> particularly answering some quite difficult questions <laughs> in terms of the uh, future of things uh, and uh, uh, and making yourself available. Look, I, I found I found the propeller and the, the pieces fascinating and how you related them to um, to, uh, you know, the aviation and the history and uh, provenance and, uh, and 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 how difficult they are to research particularly that stupendous propeller <laughs> and uh, and look honestly the information you've given us in your answers has been just uh, brilliant as well so um, you know by acclamation I think we ought to really thank you very much for that <laughs> uh, no worries it's, it's been a pleasure meeting you all and uh, and uh, you know hope, hope to see you again and uh, you know, good work on keeping all this material alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll be lobbying you. a bit too. <laughs> on things, never mind. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. We'll we'll finish up now. Is every that all right with everybody else? Yes. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, all right. Brilliant Thank you. presentation. Thank yeah, you so awesome. much. We're really, really appreciative. Okay. We'll, right. we'll see you later and we'll correspond <laughs> as well to thank you. Thank you so much. Bye then. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. End meeting for all. Cheerio.